Good morning. Good morning. So Roxanne's story today should be, and that song, should be a strong encouragement to us. If Christ is for us, who can be against us? And we can change that to nothing as well as no one. I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 5, the first 20 verses. I'll give you a chance to turn to that. But I want to say something. This story might seem fitting because what's today? But don't be fooled. The demonic realm and the enemy are real. If you have an opportunity to talk to someone who has ministered or lived in India, Asia, the Middle East, South America, you'll hear stories of the reality of the power of darkness over people's lives. In our culture, people are like supernatural. Nah, don't. Be fooled. The power of the enemy is real. Demons are real. They don't have to bother so much with our country because of our attitude of heart. But so many are enslaved and are afflicted by the power of demons. We're going to read about that here right now. They went across the lake to a region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained, hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What's your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town, in the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and the people were amazed. Uh, 
a couple of years ago when we had first bought our house, we had gone through a season in which, Calvin, I'm going to use you as an illustration. I probably should have told him before I did this. Where Calvin decided that he was going to get up in the middle of every night, watch TV, make a box of macaroni and cheese, hang out, maybe go outside, do what he was going to do on his time, and then sleep late, not make it to school. You know the whole routine for all you parents who got kids. And so I got smart. I decided to set my alarm every night at 2.30 in the morning. And then I would get up and I'd open the door and I'd listen. And every once in a while I'd catch him, but he's usually better than that. He knew I was coming. One night I woke up, I opened the door, and as soon as I opened the door, the door creaked. And the light downstairs went out. And I thought, I got him. I was so excited. I got him. So I, I go downstairs, I go rushing down, no one's down there. The lights are off. I go through the first floor. I'm opening closets. No one to be found. So then I think, well, maybe someone's in my house. The people who owned the house before us had given keys to everybody. So who knows who's in my house? So I go back upstairs. I grab my home protective device. It's literally a hatchet. And I walk back downstairs. I go through every closet, every room. I got you. I'm opening the door. I go down in the basement where we never go super creepy. All the lights are off. I'm tiptoeing around. At this point, I don't know if it's Calvin or not. I think, well, maybe he ran behind me and up the stairs as I was coming around the corner and he got me. So I go back up into his room and he's in bed. And I say, Calvin, get up. I know you're awake. And he rolls over and he says, what? Now imagine Calvin's perspective. His dad's yelling at him with a hatchet in his hand. <laughs> In the middle of the night, I was so convinced that Calvin was faking it. Why were you downstairs? I wasn't. We're arguing for a second back and forth. I realized that he was actually asleep. Who turned the light off? So now my heart is like going, you know. I'm like, all right, so I'm going to go. First of all, I told Calvin, I said, well, I think there's an intruder, so you better get up. Big tough guy, all the big talk about how you're going to defend your family. Turns out he went back to sleep. But anyway... So I got my hatchet, I go up into the attic, I'm searching every nook and cranny. My house is 115 years old. It's got nooks and crannies. There are places to hide. So I'm walking through my heart. I can barely breathe, pumping out of my chest. I'm ready. Good thing it wasn't Calvin, because I don't know what would have happened if I actually caught someone in one of the closets. So I go through the whole house, found no one. All the windows were locked, all the doors were locked. It was so scary. My heart I could barely breathe. My heart was going. So finally, I go back up into bed. I said, okay, there's no one here. I start praying because I can barely breathe. Lord, calm me down. I know you're in charge. I know you're more powerful. Even if there were somebody, you're going to take care of us. It was just this, just this cry. I laid there for like two hours. I couldn't fall asleep. I finally fell asleep and was able uh, to get a little bit of rest. You know, that was a scary story. That was scary for me. That was some of the most the biggest, or the, the most fearful times uh, that I've ever had to go through. Today we talked about is Halloween. Today is a day that the world celebrates everything scary, spooky, horrible, horrific, ghastly, you name it, right? And so today it sort of seems appropriate that we should talk about a story about a demon-possessed man on a day that much of the world glorifies this very idea. And so we're going to weave a couple elements together through to, uh, to this message. I'm hoping to, to paint a picture for you of how we should really approach this holiday as believers. I, I, I almost don't want to say holiday because you know the word holiday comes from holy day, right? This day, this day, October 31st. The story that we read today, the true story, demonstrates the power of the spiritual forces of darkness over humanity. It demonstrates very clearly the fact that there are forces out there that wield control over our lives. They wield influence on us. And we need to be aware of that, not because we need to be afraid, but we need to know who is stronger than those who seek to hold us captive. In the end, we know this is it. Jesus' power far surpasses any of the powers of evil that surround us. And this is Mark's whole idea. This, he's wanting us to know that Jesus is greater than anything and stronger than anyone. Now, we need to have a clear perspective on this as Christians. Because what we'll do is we'll end up 
doing one of few things. We'll either approach it as if the whole day, we might as well just lock our doors and go to sleep and wake up on November 1st, that we need to shun the entire day. Another perspective would be that the things of evil, we can minimize them, make light of them. We see it all the time, the costumes that are often worn. There's this mix between sort of humor and evil. Or we just totally ignore it altogether. As we go through this passage today, I want to weave through another passage in it. So I want us to look at this text through the lens of this verse. It's John 1, 5. It says, the light, this is Jesus, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the light. Who's the light? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the light. And so the first point from the story today I want us to see is the forces of darkness fear the light. You see, Jesus went across to the region of the Gerasenes. He had just got done stilling a storm. Now, if you remember in the passage before, Jesus is in the boat. He's asleep. The storm's kicked up. The disciples are fearful. And they say, what are you going to do? Sleep through it. We're about to die. Jesus gets up and says, be still. And it says that the disciples feared the power of Jesus. Even they saw what Jesus could do. So Jesus goes to the other side of the region of the Gerasenes and he is met almost immediately by a man who Mark says has an impure spirit. It says, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Now you need to understand what this idea of tombs is. Because we sometimes, I mean, I know I did it as I was reading through it initially. I had the idea of a cemetery. You know, I was trying to link it to today, what would it be like if a man lived in the cemetery? But I need you to understand a little more that it's not like a cemetery like we see. It's not like there's beautiful stones and manicured grass, and this is a place where people go on the anniversary of their loved one's death. No, this place was essentially caves. It was a dark place full of caves, hewn out of the stone, that they would allow bodies to decay. And once the body decayed, they would reclaim the bones and then reutilize the tomb. So it was a place that was just associated with death and decay. And this, this is where that man lived. But it's no wonder why when we read more about him, it says he lived in the tombs because no one could bind him. They tried to bind him with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot. But he was so strong that he was even able to break the chains that bound him. And nobody was strong enough to subdue him. You know, in this instance, the demons within this man made him, among other things, remarkably strong. Mark wants us to see that this man was impossible to control by human means because they had tried, they had chained him. They had resigned him to live in tombs away from society. The Bible, as we've seen here in Mark and elsewhere, clearly proclaims the existence of another realm, a realm of darkness where there are forces of evil and forces of good battling out for us, God's creation. Sometimes we see demonic influence in this world, and we can see it just by looking around. Watch TV for a while. Watch TV for 10 seconds, and you'll get to see it, all the commercials. And if you pay attention to the advertisements, you sort of get an idea as to what they're using as their hook to get us to pay attention. You know, I remember growing up, and even with my own kids, watching TV, seeing a commercial, and what's the famous phrase? I want that. I want that. And it's no wonder, as you watch the commercial and you see how they portray the toys, or, well, there's things I see I want too. Big Mac. I want that. The world uses means, demonic means, even, to get us to pay attention to get us under control. More than that, there's often demonic oppression. I can speak from personal experience with that. Before I was saved, I was oppressed. I was oppressed, recovering drug addict, lived a life of my own way, didn't believe in God, wanted things to be my way, and tried to make people make it that way. There were things I look back on that I realized I've dealt with that I had no idea what was actually happening. But now as a child of God, I look back and it's like, oh, no wonder. No wonder. In the worst case of all, as we see here, is demonic possession, where an evil spirit, an impure spirit, is what Mark says, actually resides in, somehow, 
the person and affects them. So the existence of this demonic realm is true, yet we don't want to be, and God has not left us to fend for ourselves. In fact, he tells us very clearly that these forces exist. In Ephesians 6.12, Paul says this. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know, sometimes when I get into a, you know, a situation where I'm interacting with someone and there's strife, Right? It's easy for me to say, oh, they're the problem, that person's the problem. And probably vice versa, I'm the problem in their eyes. But the truth is, is that Paul wants us to know that there are often spiritual forces behind what we do. And it's those that we have to be most worried about. And so this man was put into the tombs because he's dangerous and outcast and driven by forces that would keep him in bondage. As we look at this story, we see it's replete with this idea. It's all full of uncleanness and evil. There's a, I mean, there's tombs where there's dead bodies and decaying. There's an, unpure, or an impure spirit, as Mark calls it. The Gerasenes was a Gentile territory, so non-Jewish area and Gentiles in the Jewish mind were viewed as unclean. And there's a story about pigs. And so everything in this story points to the demonic realm. He was not only dangerous to others, but he was a dangerous to himself. When I read this, my heart breaks for this man. It says, night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Imagine living near that man. You know, I was just telling someone today, when the ambulances go down 83, you, the coyotes start going off. You can hear them, like they start howling around our house. What if I lived and there was a howling and it turned out to be that guy? who lives in the cemetery because no one can be by him because he's dangerous to them and dangerous to others and not even the police or the SWAT team or the military could come get him because he was so strong. So they just let him be. And to hear him crying from that tomb, oppressed and controlled by these demons. I have to be honest, this is one of the most heart-wrenching pictures of anybody trapped that I know of in the Bible. I can identify with this man, and I know some of you in some of your stories, and I know some of you can identify with him as well. I've known the helplessness of being trapped in darkness and having no escape, having cut off relationships, hurting myself with stones, crying out when no one would listen, and no one could control me. You see, this is what the devil and his forces want to do to each of us. All of humanity, indeed, we were created for a relationship with God. And they'll do whatever they can to prevent us from having the relationship with God for which we were created. We were created for intense, intimate relationship, face-to-face -face with God. Yet when we chose to go our own way and sin and do our own thing, God had to step away. But Jesus came to restore all of that. Look at verse 6. It says, When he saw Jesus from a distance... He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. This idea in Greek is actually the idea of worship. Some translations say he actually fell at his feet and worshipped him. So this is this demon-possessed man bowing down before Jesus. He shouts at the top of his lungs, What do you want with me? And listen to what he calls him. Jesus, Son of the Most High God. He says this as Jesus was saying, Come out of the man, you impure spirit. Now think about this. If I were... A demon and I were possessing this man and I saw Jesus the creator of everything getting out of a boat I would not have run towards him I would have run the other way I would have hidden in a tomb I would have tried to evade what I knew was inevitably true that Jesus was here and I was in trouble yet what this man does is he runs to Jesus and falls at his feet the sense that I get is that Jesus summoned him summoned him in fact, when we look at the story right before, remember he calmed the waves and he called the, calmed the storm? He crosses the, the Sea of Galilee to be confronted with this man to do his thing and then he's sent away. Jesus had to have known he was going there for one person and one person alone. Jesus had an appointment. A demon-possessed man, a Gentile in another region, surrounded by uncleanness, and he was coming to rescue him. An interesting study in this passage, we won't go through it now, but if you ever get the opportunity to look through this text, look carefully at the pronouns, at who's speaking. It's a little bit easier in the Greek if you knew how to conjugate the verb, like, you know, by person and number. 
but you cannot discern where the demon is speaking and where the man is speaking. There's such this conflation. There's such this, and isn't that like that? I know it was like that with me. That when I was oppressed, sometimes I would speak, sometimes I felt like whatever was oppressing me would speak. It's hard to tease out. A lot of us who have kids or a lot of us who have loved ones who are struggling with addiction or with mental illness or with various things, sometimes see, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Like, when do I hold them accountable for their actions because it's them? And when do I realize that there's some sort of mitigating factor here? There's this confusion between the two and it's certainly present here in this man. But the man comes and he bows down before his creator. You hear that? I'm not just speaking about the man who's demon-possessed bowing down before his creator, but I'm talking about the demons bowing down to their creator. You see, Jesus created those demons. At one time, they worshipped Jesus. They worshipped the Father and the Trinity in heaven in perfect light. Yet they chose to disobey God and God cast them out of heaven. And so when we read of demons, know that they were once good, once worshiping God, and they chose to go their own way. He bows down in total submission before this higher authority, Jesus. What's so interesting about this? It's a no contest encounter. There's no fight. The world will have you believe that there is good and that there is evil and that they are battling and we're holding our breath and biting our nails to figure out who's going to win. We sometimes see it in this idea of maybe a yin and a yang. You guys familiar with that symbol, the circle with the two sort of intertwining? And this is a very common theme among religions around the world. It's a very common theme in Hollywood, in the books we read. There's a narrative arc that's very common to life that we see this epic battle between the forces of good and the forces of darkness. What you need to know sitting here today on Halloween is that it is a no contest fight. Amen. That it's not waging back and forth and we're not, we don't know how it's going to, we win. We win. In the book of Revelation at the end, at the last battle, it says that Jesus destroys his enemies with a word. He just stands and says, enough. They fall down. The demon calls Jesus son of the most high. You see, demons know who Jesus is. Not only that, he says, you're the son of the Most High God. In the Old Testament, the phrase Most High God was really a, a title used of the God of Israel in a way that thrusted his superiority above the gods of the surrounding nations. So it wasn't just saying God's God, God. He's saying my God is bigger than your God. So whether you were in Philistia or you were in Syria or you were in the Gerasenes, Jesus is the Most High God and Jesus is his son, and they know their fate. Jesus asked him, what's your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him not to send him out of the area. As a creator, I guarantee that Jesus knew the demon's name. Yet he asks, why would Jesus ask the demon's name? Now, there's some that would say that this is part of sort of like a, a cultural understanding of if you can get the name of the demon, then you can cast it out. Jesus doesn't need to know the demon's name. He created the rules. Jesus asks him what's his name and gives him the opportunity to say legion, for we are many. I think he does this because he wants those who are standing there watching to know that this is not Jesus against one demon. This is not the 50-50 battle against evil and good. This is is Jesus against insurmountable power. And yet Christ comes and delivers this man. The word legion is important. It's actually the word used for a group of Roman soldiers of about 6,000 men. 6,000. So imagine being controlled by something you didn't understand, by a power greater than you, being helpless and outnumbered struggling to get out, and in your head hearing 6,000 voices telling you you're stuck. You're never going to be different. This is your life. This is where you stay, and there's nothing you can do about it. 
The word here that I, I think about when I see this man is the word commandeered. You guys know those you know, police movies, there's a guy on the run and the cop doesn't have a car, but he needs a car, so he runs up to the first car he sees and he takes the guy out, he says, I need it for police business, and he take, that's commandeering. That's an authority coming and saying, I'm going to use what you have to do what I need to do. And the demons did the same thing with this man. They commandeered him. So we see this encounter of Christ, Son of the Most High, creator of all that is and ever will be, standing against this man possessed and in bondage by these demons. And it's a no contest fight. Verse 11, a large herd of pigs, again, an unclean animal. You need to understand that. According to Jewish understanding, according to the Old Testament law, pigs were unclean. A large herd of pigs was feeding on nearby hillside. And the demons begged Jesus, send us into them. Allow us to go into them. Listen to the word, allow us to go. And it says he gave them permission. Look at Jesus. That's our Jesus. That's our Savior being asked permission by 6,000 demons and our Savior giving permission, permission granted. That is the God that we serve. That is the Lord that we follow. The one with utmost power. And the forces of darkness know it. I've read several commentaries about this piece right here, and there, it seems that there's a lot of confusion or maybe argument about, well, what about these 2,000 pigs? I mean, this is several people's annual salary, livelihood. This is Jesus coming in and casting out demons out of this one guy and destroying an entire region's lifestyle. I don't know the answer. All I know is that Jesus made the pigs. Jesus made the demons. Jesus made the people who are hurting the pigs. Jesus can do whatever he wants. I think the bigger part of the story that we often miss here is that Jesus knows that one of his people, one he would call child who is in bondage, is worth more than 6,000 or 2,000 pigs. It's worth more than any of that. So when we see Jesus standing in authority, when we see Jesus standing above them, while he is in us and we have power because of him, because of him, not because of us, we still need to be careful that we aren't flippant, dismissive, or minimizing about the forces of evil. They're there. John, the apostle, in his first letter warns us here. He says, Dear children, you are from God and have overcome the world because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Not you are greater. The one who is in you, Christ, is in us. So we see that the forces of darkness fear Jesus, the light of the world. Who's the light? Jesus. All right. You got one. Thanks, Steph. This is the second point. Those who walk in the darkness often fear the light. Those who walk in darkness often fear the light. It says those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what happened. And they came, they saw this man who had been demon-possessed. Remember the man? Sitting, clothed, dressed, and in his right mind. And it says, and they were afraid. Notice this description of this man. Remember who he was. And now look who he is. Jesus didn't cast out a few demons. Jesus didn't take the edge off so then he could go to therapy and finish his work. Jesus didn't mostly heal this man. This picture, this miracle, shows that Christ has the power to take someone who is trapped by the forces of darkness and restore him to perfect health. To exactly who God intended him to be. Christ has the power to do that in our own lives. In our own lives. The other day I was sitting at home, we had company over, there's a bunch of people sitting around the table and we, I don't know, it always comes up. It comes up in church service all the time, my mug shot. So we went and found my mug shot. That was me, I showed everyone. I felt like this guy. I felt like this guy. When people see this picture and they see me, I wonder if they see a man sitting, dressed in his right mind. I wonder if they're afraid. The Bible seems to show that they, they are, that often people who are trapped in darkness want to stay there. And because they're trapped, because they're in the darkness, they fear the light. 
While these people, look at this, they should have been grateful. This man was terrorizing them. They should have been inviting, happy, worshipful of the one who healed this man. Yet instead, they were afraid. They feared. What could they possibly fear? Maybe they feared Jesus' power. That the wielding of Jesus' power in the life of this man made them feel weak, and so it was fearful for them. Or they feared the unknown. I know as I was walking through the house with a hatchet in the dark, I really didn't want to turn the light on because I was afraid what would be there. We live our lives like that sometimes. Maybe they realized that this religious man, this holy man, had come with power and they were fear of condemnation. That they knew they had been living a life far from God and they'd rather just have him go. I see this all the time. There was a woman on TikTok several months, or two months ago maybe, um, she posted, my boyfriend broke up with me and I found out I had cancer today. It's been a banner day. <laughs> I was like one of the first ones to see it, so I commented, give your fear to the Lord, trust in him, I know it's hard, but he's going to protect you. That's months ago. And I'm still, every day, getting new comments. Months ago, there is no God. Why do you lie to her? Why do you say things like that and give her false hope? It seems like they go out of their way to say it. Why? What drives them to go out of their way? Because to embrace the truth that Christ exists and that he has power has implications. I can tell you that's the reason I didn't want to believe. I mean, I, yeah, I had lofty academic arguments and science was everything and I, I believe in science, trust me. But I used it as a reason to not believe the existence of God. I would remember, I would talk philosophically with people, and as soon as it got to the point where it began to talk about the transcendent, where there was starting to get a little gray area about unknowns, I would say, well, you're just stupid, whatever, and I'd walk away. I didn't want to encounter it. I wanted to push them away, just like they did, depart from us. And maybe it was just fear of financial loss. They lost 2,000 pigs. Who knows what else they were going to lose. This man comes and eliminates their business. Sometimes I fear that some of us don't follow Christ as strongly and devotedly as we should because we fear what it's going to do to our business. So they ask him to leave. 16, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to this demon-possessed man and they told about the pigs as well and the people began to plead, go, go. The culture has largely asked Jesus to leave this region. And notice what Jesus did here when asked to leave. What did he do? He left. We've asked Jesus to leave. So it should be no surprise that we find ourselves in the situation that we are in right now. Not only in this country, in this area, but in the world. We can invite them back. We live amid a culture that doesn't understand the light and usually doesn't want to and so asks it to leave. We need to be cautious about our participation in this culture. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that it's us and them. I sometimes write that when I'm preaching because it's the easiest way to get what I'm trying to to preach, what I'm trying to say. But in many ways, we are them. And that's the scary piece. We should look different. We should live different. We should act different. Because we follow a Lord who's called us to be different. Sometimes I have to ask myself, am I not doing this because Jesus is cramping my style? Am I not saying what I want to say or what I think I need to say, what Christ is calling me to say because I'm afraid of what it's going to look like? Or is it going to be unpalatable to the person to whom I'm speaking? Case in point, perfect today. It's Halloween. I get up and preach against Halloween. Some of you are going to go out trick-or-treating. So what do you do with that now? like, oh, maybe I shouldn't preach on that. Maybe I should take a different, more balanced, and I did, you'll see. I feel in a room surrounded by people who believe similarly as I do that Christ is Lord, the weight of trying to toe a line or find a clear distinction so as to not make people upset. If I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who love me and accept what I believe to be true, imagine being out there in the world. You guys know. Locker room talk. 
the Lord says, hey, you should say something right now. What do we say? Nope. I don't want to be that guy. We need to be cautious about our interaction with the culture. We need to be cautious in the way that the culture rejects Christ because we sometimes, without even knowing, are just falling in line with them. Like I said, I'm not suggesting that we pull out and cloister ourselves behind walls or move to a compound or commune in the middle of nowhere. I'm not lying. Part of me is like, that would be kind of cool to be like with you guys all the time, you know? I'm suggesting that amid the culture that we're in and those rescued from the darkness, we must live in the light. That's my third point. Those rescued from the darkness must live in the light. Now, I don't know your state before God. I don't know if you've asked Lord Jesus to be your Savior and you've trusted in his death. But he's calling you out of darkness into light today. Those of you who have been called out of darkness and call upon the Lord as your Savior need to embrace the light to which you've been called. Sometimes we like to take forays back into the shadows. Look at verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Do we beg Jesus to go with him? Lord, where are you going? I want to go wherever you go because I know what I've been rescued from. He didn't care where he was going. He didn't ask where he was going. He just said, Lord, I want to go. I want to go. Now, while we all cannot say that we've been rescued from demons like this man, we can all say that we've been rescued from the darkness. I think many of us minimize what it means to be trapped in darkness. We minimize the darkness itself, not only in the world as we see it, but also in our own hearts. We minimize how bad we really were. We minimize the sinful nature that we had within us. So then we look back at our life and say, well, I wasn't that bad, but I knew I needed Jesus, so I trusted him. Pastor Adam, on the other hand, lived his life, so it's really easy for him to see, you know, the truth is, is while the expression of my sinful nature came out in one way, and many of us who I know and you would agree, very distinct, obvious ways, that does not mean that those of you who have been saved at five years old and have no backstory like mine aren't, weren't rescued from the same thing. This darkness is real. And it resides in our hearts even after we're saved. Yet we must embrace the light. Ephesians 5.8, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. Even on Halloween, <laughs> what's that look like? We'll talk about that in a second. Jesus did not let him go with them, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. Listen to what he says. So he went back and he told everybody the Decapolis, 10 Roman cities. He told everybody what Jesus had done. Now, a little thing, just a little side note, I want you to point out. Jesus says, go tell everyone what the Lord has done for you, the man go, or what God has done for you. He goes back and tells everyone what Jesus had done for him. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. This is Mark's point. It's buried in there if you didn't see it. I don't know why he didn't let him go. Everywhere else he says, come follow me. He was a Gentile. I think he would have been a stumbling block to his Jewish ministry in Israel. So he let him stay there to minister to the other Gentiles in the region. Seems to make sense to me. But for Mark, this is the first missionary sent. A Gentile man, rescued from demons, sent as a missionary to his own people. Sounds a lot like us. I mean, they knew he was lost. They knew how helpless he was. They knew what he was like. And now here he is coming to proclaim the reason I'm the way I am now, Jesus, son of man, son of the most high God. This is a truth. I don't know. Someone might need to hear this, but sometimes we do more good where we are than where we want to go. We do more good where we are than where we want to go. Jesus tells the man, to live as a living witness to the light that cast out the darkness that was in him. As Christians, we need to embrace the light and shun the darkness. We must focus on what's good and joyous and life-giving. I wonder what this man thought after he got saved. Do you think every once in a while, maybe one time a year, he went back and camped out in the tombs? 
hey, let's celebrate who I was. I suspect not. He understood the nature of the dark. He knew what was there, and he knew what had happened to him, and ultimately he knew his Jesus. So what do we do with today? What do we do with today? How do we interact as Christians with Halloween? I saw a video, a guy said, I don't know why we do anything. We should shut our doors, not participate in anything. He was a a man who had come out of Satanism, and he's like, this is our day. I reject that notion. Every day is Jesus' day, okay? But we need to be careful. We need to be cautious. We need to have our eyes open. So a few points right here at the end I just want you to think about as we celebrate celebrate Halloween, probably not the right way of saying it. as we try to be light amid the dark. Every day of the year, first, every day of the year, Jesus is more powerful than the forces of evil. Satan does not own this day. This might be a day that they claim for their use. This is Jesus' day. Jesus' day. Nevertheless, the forces of darkness and people motivated by them take Halloween to be a day of special spiritual significance. And this should give us pause. When we consider Halloween and those who use it for spiritual purposes, and they say, this is our day. Well, in the end, we know Jesus is stronger. We need to be cautious. We need to be careful. If we're going to participate in the festivities of Halloween, we must do so with caution and a clear intent, listen to this, to look different. To look different than the culture. This means our decorations, our costumes, our focus, our motivations, and our participation with the world should be such that we embrace the light of Christ and we shun that which is evil, or listen to this, or glorify sin, death, and decay. That means our costumes should not be a dead zombie Moses, but it should be Moses. When someone asks your kid, who who are you? What if they said, I'm Ruth from the Bible? Would that be cool? I don't know. I could probably make it cool. We have to look different. We have to be different because we are different. We've been called out of the darkness and into the light. We need to embrace that light every day of the year, Halloween especially. And at the very least... Halloween should be a day that we reflect on what we were rescued from when Christ saved us. The light that he gave when he purchased us by his death on the cross. So when we're driving, we see little ghouls running around and little goblins or whatever. Don't use it as an opportunity to and judge that person. Use it as an opportunity. Let it be a trigger in your mind to say, that's a reminder of what I was saved from. That's a reminder of the forces of darkness that do exist, that were out to get me. But Jesus, the light of the world, saved me. So in conclusion, three points again, so in case you didn't get them. The forces of darkness fear the light. Those who walk in darkness often fear the light. And those rescued from the darkness must live in the light. So what about the light in my house? What was it? Why did the light go off? I went to sleep. I woke up the next day. I don't know about you, but if you ever like, if I'm working on like a Sudoku puzzle or a crossword and I'm stuck, if I leave it for a while and I come back, as soon as I pick it up, I get it. I woke up, first thing on my mind, I know what it was. I remember waking up, it was 2.29 exactly. And so when I walked over to the door and I opened the door, I saw the light go out. What I saw was the reflection of the front porch light, which is on a timer. And so when I opened the door and looked out, it was just so happened to be perfect, the light went off. So Calvin, you're safe this time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your son Jesus and that he willingly came to die on our behalf. We pray, Lord, that you would keep this as a reminder in our hearts and in our lives every day, especially this day. 
Lord, we pray today, we know that the spiritual forces of darkness and the people who seek to worship them are praying this day that it would be theirs. That they would gain spiritual ground. That they would control regions and areas. And Lord, worst of all, our kids. We pray against that, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And we ask that today would be a day that we would be cautious and circumspect. But Lord, it would be a day that we remember what you called us from and to what you called us. The light. Help us to be different, Lord. Help us to be careful and cautious. Help us, Lord, to be in this culture while proclaiming your light and not becoming part of it because we are called to be different, children of light. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.